And yes. so I'm becoming um, more and more um, hard-hearted and manipulative of other people. Mm-hmm. Where basically, like everybody else, are like chess pieces that I have to kind of maneuver around or through to yes. make my way. Yes. But they, but I'm not interested in their feelings. You know, I'm not interested in them as people. They're just they're just things that you have to deal with all the time. You know. And some of them are pleasurable things to deal with, and some of them are very disagreeable. And so um, I just try and adopt this persona of being the biggest, baddest bear in the woods, you know. Mm-hmm. I, that way I will get my way, you know, being kind of like a, um, a little mini tyrant in my little world. And it's very painful to see all this in this company because um, they were sharing with me their feelings of um, extreme disappointment because what they were interested in as we watched my life was where I had been kind, loving, compassionate. Um, One of the scenes that... So you you, you felt their disappointment, not judgment, or were you feeling judgment, or were you judging yourself? Um, More of me judging myself because they were sharing with me that I was um, completely failing what I had been created for and what they had expected of me. Well, that doesn't sound so good. Like, for example, um, my father and I, as I became an adult, our relationship went from bad to worse to the point where we no longer even had a relationship, and I had always thought, all my life, then my father had been a big jerk, and I'd been the victim of a really lousy father. But what I saw in this whole experience was is that I had um, contributed to the failure in our relationship. Sure, I had gone out of my way to antagonize him and to be unsympathetic to him. You know, so I had to take some responsibility for the failure of that relationship. But see, you're not describing anything so bad at all that almost everybody can't in some way or another identify with what you're saying right now with respect to their life. Yeah, and I, th- I think um, by our the standards of our culture, what we call good isn't good enough. It's not what we were created for and what God expects of us. Hmm. God expects a whole lot more than what we're um, giving back to God. And I, at, at several points I said, okay, that's enough. I don't want to see any more of this. Like, you know, I get it. You know, yeah. I said, no, you got to watch this. And one of the things that happened that was funny is every time we'd go close to um, a period of my life where I had won a prize or an honor or a promotion, you know, or some kind of um, Something achievement, true. yes, they, they would, like, skip it. And I'd say, hey, wait a minute. <laughs> you just missed. You know, you, yeah. you just skipped over something. This was, like, really big, you know. And, plus pl- point over there and going right past it. Yeah, and they'd say, no, that was nothing. Watch this. And they'd show a scene of me blowing off a student who had come to see me, you know, for um, some sympathetic um, advice. And I was just like, you know, I'm I'm thinking in my head while the student's like whining on about their, you know, um, sad little love life. I'm thinking, oh, man, you know, they don't pay me enough to listen to this garbage all day long, you know. (laughs) Yes, I'm with you. (laughs) And um, what they had hoped I would have done was to have um, cared about that person, you know, given them a little time and attention. Not yes. that my job wasn't to fix them, but to simply, you know, be there for them, to to care about them, be compassionate. So right. it was uh, my life review as it progressed um, was increasingly a disaster, and I'm like really embarrassed and ashamed. And the only good part of it was is that I knew that the company that I was in, Jesus and the Angels, were um, that they loved me in spite of the fact that they knew everything about me. They knew all my dirty little secrets and all of right. the rotten things I'd done in the world and they still loved me although they, I can really say that they hated things that I did they still loved me as a person just as um, I loved my kids no matter what they do, no ma- you know, even if they make me really angry or displeased with them, I still love them. Right. And I knew that th- I was loved even though... In that same sense. Yeah. Yes. So um, when it was over, I was like, 
really relieved. And it's like, boy, I never want to do that again. Whatever you do, don't show me my life. You know? I'm not. I'm not looking forward to it myself. Yeah. I mean, there, there are things that I I know uh, that I'm not going to want to review. Yeah. And uh, they said, "Do you have any questions?" And I went like, <laughs> "Questions?" <laughs> any I questions? said, "I got I got about a million questions." <laughs> and they said, "Go ahead, ask anything you want." So um, I had the most wonderful experience of asking questions and they would um, answer everything I asked and they were very kind teachers because the things that I asked they would um, try and explain it in a way that I could understand and of course the audience is obviously going to want to know what you did ask and what kind of responses you got anything that is, we should know well I mean, there's such a range of things I could just you know um, go on for days about this, but I could give you a sample of some. Please like, do, yes. In terms of um, like a personal question, I said, "Why did God make me a person who was never um, satisfied with like what I was told? I was always like trying to find out more and more and more." You know. Good question. You know why? Why did God make me a person who just wondered about everything all the time and was never, um, never seemed to be able to. Um, just yes. accept things like other people could just accept it. I couldn't accept it. Right. Really and, good question. And they said that that was um, a really special gift from God. The only problem was is that I had misused the gift because the purpose of having that kind of a mind was to be able to discover the truth. And they said whenever I found the truth, I would just like, well, that's not it, and I'd keep going. You know. So um, instead of seeking the truth and finding the truth. I would, um, I turned seeking into um, its um, own end. I was just always questioning and never mm -hmm. um, receiving the answer, even when it was given to me. Right. You know, so it was like nothing ever, nothing ever satisfied me or made me happy. You know, it's like my wife loves me. Does she really love me? I don't know if she loves me. Why does she love me? Why would she love me? You know, I mean, it's like she doesn't love me. How could she love me? You know, like, you know what I mean? Sure. When the fact was, she did love me, and it stuck by me for 20 years, and is like obvious to everybody in the world except to me, you know, that, that sort of thing. So um, I um, asked them. Um, this was in 1985, and one of the things that I'd grown up with was um, the very real possibility of a nuclear war that would annihilate the whole planet. Yes. And so I said, um, "Is there going to be a nuclear war?" And they said, absolutely not. And I said, well, why not? And they said, God's not going to allow it. And I said to them, I said, you guys don't get it. There's like 40,000 nuclear weapons. You really always... you said that to them? Yeah. And I was, well, I was really comfortable with it. I mean, these people were good. You know, these are really... Uh -huh. And I said, there's 40,000 weapons poised and ready to go. And even if no one actually planned a nuclear war, it's just inevitable that somebody's going to... Um, accidentally set something off and then there's going to be a nuclear sense and the whole earth's going to be an island. I said, it's not going to happen. God's not going to allow it. And I said, so is God going to take God's hand and just like stop the missiles when they're launched? And I said, if that's what it's going to take, God will do it. And they said, the planet doesn't belong to people. I said, the planet and all that's in it belongs to God and God cares about it all the creatures in the world, not just people, and God's not going to allow human beings to destroy the earth. And it's like, oh, okay. you know. Um, Good answer again, if true. Um, Reverend, hold on, we're at the bottom of the hour. Oh, this is really getting good. So he actually had the opportunity to ask questions. And one of them was about nuclear war. We will uh, continue with all of this in a moment. My guest is the Reverend Howard Storm. He's in uh, Kentucky right now and has a church in Norwood, Ohio. We'll be right back. This is Coast to Coast AM with Art Bell on the Premier Radio Networks. Really interesting, really interesting watching the reactions on the uh, Fast Blast to the Reverend Storm. There's uh, it, every range you can imagine from thank you 
to I've always wondered, to it worries me, to boy am I angry, this is just a religious advertisement, to you, you name it, the entire range of spectrum of reaction you might get to a story like this. And I've never had one told on the story uh, on the air like this. No story like this, certainly. And so it's kind of interesting to observe the reaction out there. It ranges from uh, joy to, I guess, just passionate interest, passionate interest to anger. He's written a book called My Descent into Death and the Message of Love, which brought me back. And I just went over, uh, went myself to Amazon.com. And it received a five-star review. You know, they take a uh, an average of all the uh, customer reviews who have read the book, and it's got a full 